Welcome to Strange Weekly News. In this show, I'll be taking a look into the, all the news and headlines to pick out curious reports of the strange, the weird, and the mysterious. Anything from UFO news to science advancements, the paranormal, and stuff labeled fringe science and fringe phenomena. Each news item we go over in the show, I will place all the links of them in the description box below once this live show is over, as well as chapters on the timeline index. Welcome to all my first time viewers and listeners. As some of you know, we just hit 20,000 subscribers on YouTube. And you know what? This show is the most popular show out of all the other content that I create on YouTube. It is weekly strange news that you love the most. And I simply cannot say thank you enough because it is because of you and you sharing these videos on on other platforms, on forums, uh, with other people. So all of this growth that has happened here is because of you. And I am truly incredibly grateful for that. I would like to say hi to some people in the live chat. Rose, Be the Arrow, Jonicide, Hides, Michael, Darkstar, Britt. Oh, starting soon. Hey there, Christina. <laughs> Maka, Eddie. Welcome, everyone. There are a few things that I would like to mention before we get started. On Tuesday, my guest for Shifting the Paradigm, we had Gen Z Bigfoot investigator and researcher Emily Fleur. So we got to hear a new and fresh perspective on the research of Sasquatch. And she mentioned things that I had never considered or even heard of. So it was a really fascinating conversation. If you haven't seen it, go take a look at that. Then on Thursday, on Mysteries with the History with my co-host Jimmy Church of Fade of Black Radio, we covered most haunted places from around the world. So on this channel, you get a bunch just of different shows each week, and they're all totally different for everyone to enjoy. But now let's get into some strange news. And to help me out today, we have Puck the Puck Wedgie. Hey, Puck, how's it going? For those new, a Pukwudgie is a little goblin that resides at in the Bridgewater Triangle in Massachusetts. There are these little mischievous evil things, but it's the name that is just so adorable, Pukwudgie, that you're like, my heart, it just, it just melted into a puddle. And I ended up getting a plushie of a Puck Wedgie. And his name is Puck. So let's get into our first article. I'm going to share an image just as a visual aid. And it's actually it's actually a really pretty photo that I found online. So for those art fanatics out there, you might appreciate this particular photo. Again, it's merely a visual aid, but take a look at this. It's Starry Night, but with a UFO in it. So let's... Actually, with this first article, I'm really excited uh, for this one in particular because we're going to change things up just a little bit. This, as we know, we're getting to the end of the year. We're already in December. And as we say every single year, dang, that year flew by. And it just gets faster and faster every year. Like you blink and it's already it's already winter time. Well, there is I have this article ready for you. And it's all the a handful of UFO sightings in New York State that happened in 2022. So if you are from New York, I think you're going to enjoy this article, um, definitely. But what's even more interesting about this one that I think everyone's going to like is that these are very, very short descriptions of people that have witnessed UFOs. So we're going to kind of play a game here. I'm going to read this short description and the location that it took place and think to yourself, write down in the live chat or write down in the comments if you really think it's a UFO, a drone, debris, satellites and other tech or black projects. So make sure to listen very closely to these very short details and then come up with your own conclusion on what you think it might be. And it's going to be really fun. So let's start off with our first one from Port Washington, New York State. This report claims the person heard an unfamiliar swirling hovering sound and spotted an object moving erratically outside their home. And as soon as they started recording it, it disappeared in a blink of an eye. Next one from Salem. This reporter saw an orangish 
yellow row of lights in the sky, and the object disappeared when two jets entered the area. So we just covered two. Out of those two that we just mentioned, what do you think it is? A UFO? Drone? Black project? Debris? Satellites? Take a guess, because we don't have the answers. But we can we can muse about it. We can assume. We can guess. And that's the fun part about this. Moving on to our next one. In Van Etten, this reporter saw a light with a perfect ring around it and then spotted a smaller light separate from the larger light. It flew around it and then later returned. That's an interesting one. Deranged Lunatic, thank you so much for the super sticker and supporting the RV fund. Sound Beach, New York. This reporter claimed to see a large gold ring appear through their window. They also claimed to hear a loud humming sound. The light changed and it looked like a spider with long light trails when they went outside to look at it. This one's an interesting one. We have covered a, a handful of UFO sightings, more recent ones. But for someone to describe it as spider-like, that one is a first for me. Have you heard anything like that yourself before? I was blown away. Moving on to our next one. In Gilderland, New York, this reporter claimed to have heard a rumble from the night sky and upon further investigation, discovered a disc-shaped object estimated to be about 50 to 100 feet in diameter with a bright green light underneath it and moving slowly overhead. Should I give my opinion on this one? No, we're going to let you guess on these. This next one uh, took place in Kew Gardens, New York, and it didn't claim this person didn't claim to see a UFO, but actual aliens in their apartment. They claimed the visitors moved like fourth or fifth dimension beings and phased through both them and their furniture. This one I'm a little bit iffy about because how do people know what fourth and fifth dimensions look like? Or what, what they would assume to look like, right? So it that one's a pretty big claim going on right there. But still, fascinating. I would love to speak to this person and hear their thoughts on all the details on what happened. And why they thought it was visitors moving like fourth or fifth dimension beings. How do they know? In Port Jefferson, New York, this reporter says they were out walking their dog when a white ball of light flew past them at a low altitude and then split into three different balls of light and vanished. This detail we've heard many times before, time and time again, and a little bit more recently. And, and like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess from like the 1990s onward, this has been a reoccurring theme with this one. This reporter from Soto's New York claimed they saw four spherical objects of varying brightness and then dimmer objects moved around the brightest objects in a way described as breathing like. To me, this sounds like Christmas lights. I'm not like, I'm not saying what he saw was Christmas lights, but if I were to see something like that, bright lights, some dim lights, the dim lights going around the bright lights, sounds like a music, uh, like a like a light show to me. There should be music involved. That would just make it epic. From Hudson, New York, and as we know, Hudson, the Hudson area did have a UFO flap some time back. If you haven't looked into it, it is fascinating. So in Hudson, New York, this reporter claimed to see a large triangular black silhouette moving very slowly through the sky about 500 to 800 feet in the air, making no noise with a solid red light on it. They also claimed it was a, approximately the length of a football field. That's pretty big. That's huge, actually. In Hicksville, this reporter claimed that they and others saw a black orb hovering in the sky following a thunderstorm. That's an interesting one. A lot of the times when we 
hear stories about orbs, or when we imagine orbs, we think of them as being like white, yellow, orange, sometimes green, sometimes red, right? But black, no, you don't, you don't usually hear stories of black orbs. And then following this black orb was a thunderstorm. Could that just have been a part just naturally, naturally occurring? Or was something very, very strange? We don't know. These details are so minimal. It's disappointing. But hopefully so far you are enjoying this game of guessing what it is. Because I'm having fun here. But look, it, it could have been ball lightning. That would kind of be like my first guess ball lightning. Now, if it was a UFO, an actual one, oh, that'd be so cool. Moving on to our next one in Brockton, New York. This reporter claims that for about two weeks, they saw the same four multicolored lights spinning around one another like an atom of energy two to 15 times a night. And anytime a, a plane flies close to them, they would disappear before returning when the plane was gone. Some people would pray to see just one UFO in their lifetime. But for this reporter, uh, person that reported this, saw them for two weeks straight, two to 15 times a night. That is impressive and i bet so many people are envious of that one i have a few more for you before we wrap this article up and this one took place in new york new york this reporter claims to have seen a dark blue circular light moving through the sky and then disappeared as if it was jumping to hyperspace in star wars mark says Oh, um, Scott says that's how, and to answer Mark's question, yeah, so it's uh, it's pretty, pretty odd, if you ask me. This next one in Napanach, New York, this reporter claims to have seen a small craft flying about 100 to 200 feet above the ground near a construction zone. It then followed the car of the reporter for about 20 seconds before darting in the opposite direction without turning at great speeds. There's, we're actually going to cover another story today similar to this one in particular. So keep those details in mind because we're going to kind of sort of revisit that. In Fonda, New York, this reporter claims to have seen pulsating light orbs in the sky for several minutes and that the movement of the orbs resembled that of a jellyfish moving through the ocean. Some of these are so incredibly descriptive in just in just a few words, but you can imagine that if someone were to give you that specific detail that it resembled a jellyfish moving through the ocean, right? If you're seeing that in the sky, you can envision that. And that just sounds very cool. The last one I have for you takes place in Wappingers Falls. And this reporter claims to have seen a blue glowing object hovering in the sky and making jerking movements in all directions for about 10 minutes before it disappeared. This is an interesting detail, jerking movements. A lot of the times, with a lot of these sightings that people have had, they're very smooth movements. They can be sometimes sporadic, um, but still they're not jolty. So this one makes me question, this is kind of like a potentially a black project going on or kind of testing the waters. Like there's, there's a new pilot inside, right? Figuring it out. Or is it a UFO or is it just merely some debris or some swamp gas? Because something that has its own gravity field, right? It would be very smooth. You wouldn't have jolty movements. So that detail really stuck out to me. Well, that is it for all of my short little UFO sightings in New York. Did you enjoy this little game that we played? I read a few details and you got to guess what you thought it was. I would like to know um, if you did enjoy. We can definitely do more of these in the future, but if you weren't for it, let me know. I, I need that kind of feedback.
Dark Star says, so many reports up and down the Hudson Valley. Yes, sir. So much going on there. It's it's uh, insane. And Hudson Valley has been active for decades. I was able to speak with Whitley Strieber um, sometime back now on Shifting the Paradigm. And we, we just barely touched on the Hudson Valley. But it is a very active place. Super cool. And it's also definitely a major um, UFO hotspot. You get strange noises in the sky, too. It makes you want to go visit. I'm all for it. All right. Well, let's let's hear what you have to say before we continue on if if you enjoyed this. Full Auto says, absolutely. Rose says, fun times. Full Auto, oh, Full Auto says, uh, yeah, this is cool. We can do these for hours. Kind of like when we played that um, Mandela effect uh, kind of quiz that I played with Jimmy during Mysteries with a History. That was also a, a lot of fun. So I I can I can um, try. So Hyde says, can we get video for the reports? Not for all the reports um, have videos. And as I had mentioned, there were very little details um, from the article that I found regarding these cases. But if there are videos, I would I will look for them and I will send them over. But I can kind of try though like when when they are available so hold on to your hats for that one i'm wearing my beanie so i'll hold on to mine daniel says yes ma'am more fantastic i'm liking the feedback fantastic all right moving on to our next article i'm going to explain this in just a moment but i'm gonna take a quick sip of water I have mentioned a few times on this channel that I do not know much about Krampus. I don't. I would love to know more. And it feels like my laptop was listening because then all of a sudden I got this pop up of an article that answered all of my questions in the headline. And it says, who is Krampus and what does he have to do with Christmas? Those were my exact questions. And when I saw this article, I said, we are covering this today. We have to because it answers so many of my questions. So I'm going to share my screen here of a kind of scary picture of Krampus. And I have a few more for you, but let's start off with this one. Yeah, it looks a little spooky. Why would parents want to tell their kids anti Santa Claus during the Christmas season, right? meant to be super happy and fun and then bam you get this demonic entity known as Krumpus. lucky stone says Krumpus. i love it yeah me too it's it's a uh, if you like you know halloween and myths like that are kind of dark this story is has it all so every december Santa Claus comes out and gives presents to good children around the world, according to pop culture. But according to some myths, children who have misbehaved are instead visited by a far more frightening creature, Krumpus. But who is Krumpus? Where do these myths come from? And why does Krumpus appear around Christmas time? All of my questions exactly. Well, Krampus is a mythical creature who is often depicted with horns and a demon-like face. According to myth, which likely originated what is now Germany and Austria, the creature punished children who behaved badly. Krampus is also called Tulifi, a word that is very similar to devil. And Mountis Rust, a social anthropologist at the university in Germany, told Live Science in an email suspecting that the name Krumpus was introduced in the 19th century, but he's not certain. Traditionally, Krumpus appears on the evening of December 5th, or Krumpus Natched. And this kind of like Krumpus Night came just before the feast of St. Nicholas on December 6th. So in essence, Krumpus is kind of like the, the bad cop to Santa's good cop. 
which I, I do like that that yin and yang going on here. You got the good and the bad, but the bad surprisingly comes first before Santa Claus. That one, that, that piece of information kind of blew my mind. You're gonna, if you've been bad, you're gonna find out that you've been bad before you even assume you're gonna get presents, right? On December 5th, on the day of St. Nicholas. You already know. And you're not gonna be getting coal no. Instead, you might get hit with a tree branch or you'd be kidnapped and put in a basket. No gifts for you. No coal either to keep you warm during the winter. You're going to get hit with the branch or you're going to get stolen. Both of them are pretty scary. So, but, but of course, if kids were good, they wouldn't be kidnapped or swatted, and would instead wake up on the 6th to gifts from Santa Claus. Who doesn't love gifts as a child? You never know what you're going to open up. And that's like the most exciting part. When I celebrated Christmas, um, when I was like very small, very excited for Santa Claus, there I had two traditions. One of them, I would put all the ornaments on our fake plastic Christmas tree, and every single ornament was SpongeBob related. Good times. Secondly, is my dad told me, you know, Santa Claus is always getting milk and cookies, but what about his reindeer? You know what? We need to put some carrots out for the reindeer so that they can have fuel to travel the whole world to give all the good girls and boys their gifts. And so Christmas Eve, I'd, I'd put all my homemade cookies on a plate that tasted and like bricks they weren't not flavorful and so uh, nice shaved carrots as well for the reindeer and while it's a very something very silly and simple that little attention to detail actually taught me personally to think about others to think about everyone in the status pyramid or in the social pyramid not just the man in charge not just the ceo right but everyone below him as well and who's doing all the hard work the reindeers right they gotta fly this big fat man and all these gifts around the world they're gonna be exhausted right they gotta have some carrots for some fuel because they can't eat cookies because it's bad for them and this is a, a little fun detail, but those were the two traditions that I had. Spongebob ornaments and feeding the reindeer's carrots. Well, people sometimes dress up now, presently, dress up as Krampus on December 5th. And they participate in events called Krampus runs. Take a look at this. I was blown away. These take place in Germany. People dress up as Krampus and they go on these like little parade type marathon things. And uh, here's another image of a um, pretty freaky looking mask going on. But I did see an image that was really funny. You can type this up onto Google. And there was one Krampus character that snatched a kid from the audience. <laughs> and everyone was like filming it and laughing. But that kid that got snatched up didn't think it was very funny. Well, I was shocked to find out that Krampus runs were a thing. What about you? Have you heard of this? Because that is hilarious and I would love to participate in one. Especially in Germany and Austria, right? Like it's super cold during the winter and these look incredibly warm. These furry costumes with the big scary mask on. It's going to be warm for the rest of the day. Forget jackets. Nah, you got this full-blown furry costume going on for you. But it's not entirely certain when and how the Krampus customs began. We don't actually know. So during the Enlightenment period, during 1685 to 1815, Krampus appeared, and that was kind of when he was used as an educational tool to teach children obedience and discipline. As a lot of myths do, and we're going to get into some more uh, a little bit later, but a lot of these kind of like scary mythical creatures, it's their wives' tales meant to teach their children either a lesson or to make sure that they are obedient 
If you don't listen to me, sweetheart, you're going to be snatched up by Crumpus, put into his basket, and then be eaten for dinner. That's pretty scary if you're like four years old. Yeah, I would definitely be listening to my parents if that were the case, if I was given that threat. But as the Snicker commercial goes, you're not you when you're hungry. Maybe Crumpus is just super hungry because no one feeds him like Santa Claus. Right? Maybe. Well, that's just a little bit about Crumpus. It answers some of my questions. If you do want to read that article in detail, the links will be below on that. Moving on to our next one. This, this is really cool. Why? Because it's kind of sort of ties up with some of the UFO sightings in New York. Possibly. Let me explain after I take a sip. So the Pentagon debuts its new stealth bomber, the B-21 Raider. And I'm going to share an image of this. Why? Because it looks like a UFO. And I can just imagine the amount of people that saw this during testing and thought, aliens, this is a UFO. It has to be, right? But turns out, no, no, this is a project run by the government, and it's this new amazing stealth bomber. So America's newest nuclear stealth bomber is making its public debut after years of secret development. And as part of the Pentagon's answers to rising concerns over a future conflict with China, the B-21 is the first new American bomber aircraft in more than 30 years. Almost every aspect of the program is classified. And ahead of its unveiling Friday at an Air Force facility in Palmdale, California, as we know, that is where Jimmy Church of Fade of Black Radio resides, only artists' rendering of the warplane have been released, just like this image that we are seeing here. Those few images reveal the B-21 resembles the black nuclear stealth bomber that it will eventually replace being the B-2 Spirit. And that came out in 1988. The bomber is part of the Pentagon's efforts to modernize all three legs of its nuclear trade, which includes dealing with ballistic missiles and submarine-launched warheads, as well as it shifts from these certain campaigns of recent decades to meet China's rapid military moder modernization as well. So what's going on here? And, and Deborah Lee James makes mention, she is the Air Force Secretary for this new bomber, stating that we need a new bomber for the 21st century that would allow us to take on much more complicated threats, like the threats that we fear we would one day face from China or Russia. The B-21 is more survivable and can take on these much more difficult threats. And as we know from a military standpoint, that is how everything is seen, as protection, as threats and things like this, because if everything is just handy dandy. If everything is just great, right? They're not going to pursue um, with their techn technological developments. They're going to be like, oh, everything's fine. What's the point? And I like now I know that the objects seen by Kenneth Arnold were of a similar shape to this one that we're seeing here and not actual saucers, as well as some alleged witness reports of what crashed in Roswell, New Mexico, being similar shaped, like a delta wing, kind of like the um, Northrop YB-49, I believe. So I find that I find that interesting that we have this aircraft with such a design. And it looks pretty darn stealthy. It looks very slick. If you're listening to this on your podcast platform of choice, just type in B-21 bomber and you're going to see an image of this craft. It, it looks pretty futuristic. And we're not too sure how long it was under development, right? Because that 
that information is classified. So just imagine the amount of people that saw this and assumed it to be a UFO. Interesting. This article goes into a lot more detail if you do want to look at it. The link will be in the, in the description box below. Full Auto says decades, I guarantee it. Possibly. I, 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 can, I can guess. But I don't know. Well, as many of you know, I have an affinity with the Loch Ness Monster in Scotland. Why? Because when I was super young, I used to live in Ireland. And I once, one time I went to Scotland very specifically for my mission to look for the Loch Ness Monster. Actually, it was for nothing related to me. I just begged my dad to take me while he had to go to Scotland for whatever reason. And I said, we're going to go see the Loch Ness Monster. And of course, when I was five, I wasn't given the privilege to see one, but it seems like there might have been a photograph taken of the Loch Ness Monster. Let's talk about that. So a veteran Irish hunter of the Loch Ness Monster says he has finally proven the existence, that is in quotation marks, of the mythical beast with a clip showing a mysterious presence lurking in the waters. He admitted that it was the shock of his life when he saw a strange black shape estimated to be about 10 feet long in the lock while he watched a live stream through a webcam. Now, Eon says that the images evoke the Nessie depicted in 2007 film Water Horse and believes that they could bring the legendary lake monster from folklore to reality. He explained, I noticed a splash and movement on the screen coming into view on the right and a long black shape. And I immediately started a screen recording of this object. Do keep in mind, he was seeing this image through a webcam, not with his actual eyes because he's in Ireland, not in Scotland. I'm going to share an image here of what he captured. And I know it looks like a log. I know it does. But let's continue with this man's details. As they said, I noticed a splash and a movement on the screen coming into view on the right and a long black shape. And I immediately started screen recording of this object. I got excited because it reminded me, um, it remained on the surface of the water, moving very slowly, unlike a large fish that would leap out of the water, but would then submerge. He then states that the object was no fish or a log for that matter. It was moving at a controlled speed, slow, unlike a log which would be moving with the current. I believe it is a live creature. But he thinks that the latest images could be the most critical in the long search for proof of Nessie's existence. He added, I believe in the Loch Ness Monster after witnessing a live sighting in July of 1987. I think my video and photos on Saturday have proven the existence of the monster and brought her from folklore to reality. So... When you've been interested in the topic for so long, of course, you're going to be incredibly excited with anything that you see. I would really like to see the video that he captured uh, with this article that wasn't available. But if you find it, please tag me in it. I would love to see it. All we have right now is this image. And yeah, with this image, it's incredibly difficult to decipher what it is because you don't really see much, but it looks kind of like a log. But this person in Ireland, the an Irish Nessie hunter, was pretty darn excited to have captured this on camera with a webcam that is placed looking right over the lock in Scotland. He states there is a tail in a in shaded gray and a black round 
curved hump in the center and what it looks and like what looks like a fin near the front of the creature as well. The head and neck are at an angle from the rest of the body and that's what looks kind of like a long snout. I don't think there is anything that we know about today in the lakes and seas of the world that resemble that shape. One hypothesis for the existence of the Loch Ness Monster is that it is an unknown species. This is true. We're not too sure what's going on um, because only about 20% of our oceans have been mapped out. At 80%, we have no idea what's going on. But with this picture, I don't know what to think. And I'm going to keep an open mind here. But I know that, that we keep discovering new species in the oceans all the time. And there are massive creatures in the deep oceans that seem almost prehistoric that sometimes get snagged up in the deep sea fishing nets and especially off the coast of Japan. What do you think? about this could there be a relic marine could there be like relic marine creatures living in some of these ancient and deep lakes some of which are connected to the oceans what do you think about this article what do you think about the Loch Ness monster there have been other legends across the globe about this elusive creature we've spoken about it when we spoke about the mysteries of Utah. There is a Nessie type creature in Salt Lake. There is a nether one that we covered. I think it's in Vermont and kind of near all of these Great Lakes as well. So we're seeing these like big serpent-like dinosaur type creatures around the world. But are they real or are people just mistaking them for logs? What do you think? And do you like the stories of the Loch Ness Monster? I love them all. I, they have a very special place in my heart. Well, let's hear what do you have to say about this. As, oh, blah, blah, blah. Let me check. Adrian says, possibly connected by underwater cave systems. Possibly. Full Auto says, eh. Deep water creatures, the lake is really deep, plausible. This is true. We, we don't know, but I will state that for quite some time, the platypus was believed to be a mythical creature. Um, during the late 1700s into the 1800s, when people had sightings of this just bizarre animal they're like there's no way it exists but after they finally found a carcass they're like okay platypi are real it's a thing so the same thing could happen with nessie the same thing could happen with sasquatch as well and some of these other cryptids that while we don't currently have enough evidence people have been seeing these creatures for centuries and I started out being just interested in UFOs, but now after so many rabbit holes, I'm interested in everything strange and mysterious. It's There seems to be a convergence between all of them. Hyde says, panda bears were considered a legend. Panda bears are adorable. So are raccoons. Gosh, they are so cute. Android says, I'm not convinced of Loch Ness. I would believe in the champ monster more. It's a much larger lake. That is something that we do need to consider, right? Where we have allegedly these ginormous creatures. We need to make sure that their environment can withstand them as well. And maybe not just one, but a whole family of them, right? Jeanette says, fault lines beneath most of these creature sightings. Interesting point, Jeanette. Thank you, Sansa, for sharing that. Thank you. Well, let's talk about this one. This next one is pretty short, and it's in reference to the new NASA UAP group. We're all pretty excited for it. 
in some respects and others were thinking there's no way they're gonna make that information public but i sure do hope so i am optimistic well this man right here by the name of joshua Semetter, a Boston University College of Engineering professor of electrical and computer engineering and director of BU's Center for Space Physics, joined the NASA team to study UFOs. First off, that's a super long title, but he said in an interview that one of the problems is that the instruments used to record these things were not designed for this purpose whatsoever. Many UAP sightings come from Navy pilots who have the technology to shoot down objects, not take a high resolution picture, which is a very interesting point. He has been appointed to a to the NASA team charged with studying UAPs and creating a roadmap to better observe, study, and ultimately identify the phenomena. And so even though UFOs are not believed to be extraterrestrials from the NASA standpoint, at least publicly, it's enticing to imagine that maybe, just maybe, there's more that we can't explain. Officials say the most likely explanation for UAP sightings are surveillance operations by foreign powers or dun -dun -dun -dun, weather balloons. <laughs> but most documented accounts remain unexplained. Joshua continues, it excites the imagination and it does. This is why we're all here right now looking into this, why we are classified somewhat as the nerds in our friend groups, because not only is there, I would say, a decent amount of evidence with the UFO phenomenon, not a lot, but a good amount, it also excites, it entices the imagination of what if. It makes you look outside of yourself, outside of your, uh, out of your little world that you've created. And to look into the universe, thinking about all the other possible civilizations, all of the possible trading that's taking place there, such as Star Trek, things like Star Wars, The Expanse, and television that like this, that not only entertains us, but makes us think outside of the box as well. And people that write those scripts, they need to have researchers to help them write those scripts to make some things somewhat accurate. And those researchers, they're people like us. It's you and me, buddy. So if you want to be a script writer or be a researcher for a TV show, you can definitely do it with the knowledge that you have. So his research specifically focuses on the ionosphere, the layer of the atmosphere that interacts with solar wind and the magnetic field of Earth, creating phenomena like the aurora borealis. He also looks at other atmosphere and ionosphere events, such as how the ionosphere interferes with GPS signaling. His specialty of using sensors and atmospheric signals to better understand the environment make him well suited for the job of uncovering UAP mysteries. And someone like him, honestly, is very important for this NASA team because they are looking at this from a scientific standpoint. Not only are they collecting data from civilians, the government, and privately, all of these sightings, right? But they also need to look at it with a scientific lens. And if you're doing it the way that Joshua is, I, I do personally think it is important that we can't just claim everything as aliens. No, we can't because that's bias and it's, it's not scientific, right? Just to assume. There needs to be research conducted, data collected, hypothesis, hypothesis created, and then a theory, right? That's how it works. The scientific method. Well, it is super cool. And I am excited for this NASA UFO group. I want to I wanna know more. Moving on to our next one. This is a very short one. I love spicy food. I love hot sauce. I love everything spicy and especially things that make me cry, like cats love cats. They bring tears to my eyes. But there is this man from North Carolina that might have the largest hot sauce collection in the world. 
right here, right now, we are looking at this man's collection. He thinks that he has about 11,000 bottles of hot sauce. 11,000. I mean, look, I like hot sauce, but I'm not a fanatic like this man right here. This is him. I will tell you his name. His name is Vic Klenko. And he's been collecting hot sauce for at least 26 years. And he thinks that he has about 11,000 bottles in his collection. He says it turned into an obsession. What started as a small collection has grown into me being at the center of a culture that surrounds hot sauce. So he documents his collections on social media, and he said he has been in contact with the Guinness World Records about making his collection officially the largest in the world. And he says he hopes to organize tasting events in the future. Did he have to buy a special storage unit to put all of his hot sauce? Or like, is this in his house that he uses as like decoration or something? Because that's a lot of hot sauce just to casually have he says i wanted it I, I want it to be shared with anyone that has the love of heat as i do my end goal is to have so many bottles that there's no walls left in sight in my humble opinion he says you should be able to read and understand what the ingredients are to make it the best hot sauce he says it needs to have garlic, onion, chili pepper, vinegar, and salt. When you get into ingredients you can't pronounce, then I'm pretty much out. Peace and out. I will try everything, but I may not come back and try it again. I am totally with him on that. If you have a fascination with a certain food or condiment, right? You want it to be as natural as possible, for the most part. Now, when it comes to ramen, there are so many ingredients that I cannot pronounce. And I'm like, it's still fine. It is still delicious. And I will eat the plastic because that's practically what it is. But it is so good, especially when you're in college and you only have, what, 30 cents to buy ramen to have for dinner. That's me. And I love it. I think ramen's delicious. But yeah, there's a lot of ingredients that you're like, I have no idea. But now when it comes to ice cream. I'm a huge, I used to be a huge ice cream fanatic. And I would, I would definitely look at the ingredients to make sure that I could read those. Like it needs to obviously have milk and flavoring and salt as well. And then you get into like all these weird words that look confusing. And when you have dyslexia, it's just that more terrifying. You're like, I have no idea even what I'm reading. And so reading ingredients is super important with almost anything that you buy okay but what about you what do you like do you like hot sauce so good android says there's a authentic ramen place opening near my house it i'm so psyched i'm jelly that sounds great full auto says i need that outfit talking about this one this fiery looking one, it is it is a fun looking outfit going on there. <laughs> it is fun. But this this image right here seems very empowering. It seems very cool. And as you can tell, he has some fiery shoes. Vic has some fire shoes to match his love for heat that he has all right here. It is very cool. Android says, I like hot sauce if it's mild spicy. Hey, I got you. You got to enjoy the food sometimes and like not too much heat. James, thank you so much for the super sticker. I deeply appreciate you supporting the RV fund because as you know, I'll be graduating this upcoming year, which I am so darn excited. And then I'll be traveling the United States in, in an RV, hitting all the UFO hotspots and paranormal hotspots in the United States and all of you will be on that journey with me. So I'm pretty psyched for it. It is going to be awesome. And it'd be super duper cool. 
James says, buy more ramen, Christina. I'll buy more ramen. I'll do it. I'll do it right now. Well, actually, after today's show, I'll buy more ramen. Love them. Also from like restaurants, super good. Okay, moving on to our next one. Because I know that not everyone's interested in the ramen conversation. I get it. No problem. Well, oh, Android says, can you share your major? Absolutely. And thank you so much for these super um, chat. I'm majoring in communication, minoring in business. To be very specific, I, for like the last four years, I've just been three, whatever how many years, I've just been saying majoring in business and communication just to make it easy, but very specifically majoring in communication, minoring in business. Now you know. Oh, sorry. Okay, on to our next article. Many people have this affinity with Egypt. Egypt is just full of incredible stories, the documentation and history that you simply cannot ignore. This particular article has been making its rounds across social media because it is a fascinating find. I'm going to drink some water first. So gold tongues found in 2,000-year-old mummies in Egypt were a bigger deal than some people assumed. Why is that? Well, we are going to get into that in just a moment. I'm going to share my screen here of what people actually found. If I can find it, give me just a moment. There it is. No, that's not it. Oh, here it is. Okay. Let me share an image here as a visual aid, but also to show what Egyptologists actually found. And here we're looking at a gold tongue. And this was incredibly prevalent during the Greco-Roman era. Because as we know with the Greeks, when they were buried in ancient times, gold, uh, like a, a coin would be placed in their mouth or over their eyes. Why? So that when they crossed over, they could pay the ferryman to take them from, from one location over to the other location. And, well, this began to somewhat influence Egypt. So the same type of practice was done, not entirely, but a decent amount, where the Egyptians would create these golden tongues. Um, and they were buried with them, but not to pay the ferryman. No, sir. But instead, it was believed that when you cross over, that the body of the gods was made of gold. And if you brought this, if you had a gold tongue, if you had gold coins over your eyes, you would be able to use your eyes and tongue and all your other senses in the afterlife as well, which is very a very interesting belief system at this time, which was during... 332 BC up until about 395 AD. So for a good amount of time, this was practiced. And it's something that I think many of us can kind of in a way relate to. While with the Egyptians, they weren't necessarily afraid of death because they did believe in an afterlife as long as they were buried with the things that they needed. In more modern times, we do have this fear of death because it is unknown to us. It's not necessarily as prevalent in our culture anymore as how it used to be centuries prior. So when we look at this and we and archaeologists and Egyptologists keep excavating all of this uh, information and reading all the hieroglyphs, they've realized that they were so much more in touch with death and happy about it versus being mortified. And I find that very cool and, and in some ways actually empowering that if something bad were to happen to you, you'd be okay with crossing over. It's kind of the same with people when they have near-death experiences. They're able just to barely touch what it's like after they cross over. And for many of them, they have this spiritual awakening. Or they, when they come back, they just view the world completely different. All of their problems that seemed so big prior are like these just little tiny little grains of sand. And I, I think it's very cool. 
I haven't had a near-death experience. I don't know if I would casually want one, but if it were to happen to me, I would be excited to see that mental transformation on how I would grasp life afterward. But what about you? Have any of you had near-death experiences? Or if any of you are interested in Egyptology and things like this. And kind of talking uh, about death, I would like to mention the passing of Linda Godfrey, who was 71 years old and is notably famous for writing about the legend of the Beast of Bray Road in 1991. This launched her writing career with over 200 books on related topics, and she was a world-renowned cryptozoologist and appeared on numerous TV and radio programs and was a popular speaker at conferences and events across the world. She passed away peacefully on Sunday, November 27, 2022 at a Grace Hospice. So, so many of our condolences are with her. And while we may not know yet what it's like in the afterlife, she probably found those answers. Moving on to our next article. I have so many for you and I'm, I'm so darn excited. We're actually going to skip that one. <laughs> so when I first started doing weekly strange news, I would kind of continuously talk about Mars, Europa, and Titan. And earlier this year, it was really all over the science news outlets. Well, just recently, there have been some new discoveries about Saturn's moon Titan. And I'm going to share a picture here just as a visual aid while I go ahead and read this article for you. Because this, this is fascinating. This is our future as well. So astronomers announced Thursday that the James Webb Space Telescope spotted bright spots on Saturn's moon, being Titan, in the northern hemisphere where they found large clouds, which confirm computer model predictions. Clouds that appear in the late summertime when the surface is warmed by the sun. That is incredibly big news. So the predictions that people at NASA had has been proven by the James Webb Space Telescope. The clouds were never seen before because of the atmosphere's um, thick haze, obscuring visual light reflecting off the surface. But the JWST features infrared light capable of piercing through the surrounding smog. The discovery means that Titan is the only moon in the solar system with seasonal weather patterns, which is possible because it has the necessary atmosphere. That is so cool. That is. I was fangirling when I read this article. So previously, research shared in April found that Titan is surprisingly Earth-like regarding landscape formations with its land and dark colored sand dunes. The moon also features rivers, lakes, and seas filled with falling rain. Although the rain is liquid methane falling through nitrogen winds so yeah you know it's still a tad bit toxic for some but this is this is a really really big discovery scientists have long believed titan was unique compared to other moons in the solar system and this latest research proves their theories to be correct the new research began on november 5th with an international team of planetary scientists feasting their eyes on the first James Webb Space Telescope images of Titan. The team then looked to see if the clouds were moving or changing shape, which would provide new information about the airflow in Titan's atmosphere. Two days later, scientists reanalyzed the clouds that were in the same position, but looked like they had changed shape. This data was then sent to atmospheric modeling experts with the hopes of interpreting the data. One of those experts said that this is 
a huge breakthrough. I'm glad we're seeing this since we've been predicting a good bit of cloud activity for this season. We can't be sure the clouds on November 4th and 6th are the same clouds, but they are a confirmation of seasonal weather patterns. The telescope also detected a range of elements, including sodium, potassium, and water vapor in the exoplanet's atmosphere. This is big news. This is so, this is so exciting. And we are aware that there are plans to go over to, um, for probes to go over to Europa and Titan sometime in the future. That's already under planning by NASA. And it makes you question with these elements that are found in Titan's atmosphere, what life could thrive there? Because as we know, life is possible kind of sort of almost anywhere. We've been we've we've been proven that through just little bacteria in space where we didn't even microbacteria where I didn't even think that was possible. Turns out it kind of is. So with this discovery with Titan, just imagine what kind of life, if any, could be there. <laughs> When I was reading this, totally fangirling. I was so excited for it. But what about you? With this information about Titan, what do you think about it? Are you optimistic? Kind of just shrugging your shoulders, being like, ah, oh, just another one of these? Or do you just like not, not care at all? Let me know in the live chat. I'd like to know. Let's see. Chip says bug life. It could be. <laughs> Abby says, it's uh, raisin methane, not good for tourism. Unless you have like a really, really good spacesuit. But yeah, totally agree with you. <laughs> not too good for tourism. And no singing in that rain, says Mark. I like that joke. But no, death. Death wish right there. Uh, Hyde says, isn't Titan larger than Mercury? And Tyler says, yep, and it's bigger than our moon, too. So, by the way, I know, although I kind of hate asking, why do I mention to please hit the like button during these shows? I mention it from time to time. And it's because the YouTube algorithm takes the stats of the um, for the amount of likes compared to views like viewers watching, and that dictates how much the show gets pushed into topic search results and on people's feeds. So your likes and smashing that, that like button is like is like the god for growth on this channel. So if you are enjoying this content, please smash the like button. If you're listening to this on a podcast format, on a podcast platform, please write a review. It really, really helps push this content more to the public. So everything that you do, this channel really depends on you, all the growth. So I want to say thank you for everyone that has been supporting and that has been liking hitting the like button. It's totally free. It's so easy to do. Just got to click it and then we can continue on with our lives, right? Super simple. Thank you so much, everyone, for supporting the channel. Moving on to our next article. In the recent, I want to say like two-ish years, celebrities have been jumping on the bandwagon with UFOs and the paranormal. Have it be creating their own TV shows on the topic or talking about their encounters or experiences with interviewers. We've seen this time and time again. Well, Miley Cyrus allegedly had a UFO encounter back in 2020, but just recently spoke about it. And there was just recently an article written about it. We are going to um, talk about that right now. First, I'm going to share an image for those that may not be familiar with Miley Cyrus. She was the star of the TV show Hannah Montana. That is the show I grew up on as a child, along with SpongeBob, of course. But here is an image of Miley Cyrus. 
So she once admitted that she couldn't look at the sky after claiming she was chased by UFOs in a truly terrifying encounter. From having her plane struck by lightning to being followed by UFOs on a casual drive, Miley Cyrus doesn't have a lot of luck when it comes to the big blue skies. So speaking to Interview Magazine about the bizarre extraterrestrial encounter, Cyrus spoke with fashion designer Rick Owens, and they spoke about the Area 51. And that's kind of where she began to talk about her experience. At one point, Rick said that while he doesn't really believe in aliens, it seems a little arrogant to assume there's nobody else but us. Then Miley Cyrus said, well, I had an experience myself back in 2020. And she said that while she was driving, doing a nice casual drive with a friend, um, she says, I got chased down by some sort of UFO. I'm pretty sure about what I saw, but I'd also... That she had also been doing some drugs as well. But the best way to describe it is it is kind of like a, a flying snow plow. It had this big plow in the front of it and it was glowing yellow. I did see it flying and my friends saw it too. And there were a couple of other cars on the road and they also stopped to look. So I think what I saw was real. The experience really got Cyrus so much that she couldn't really look at the sky the same because she feared they might come back. And to be fair, you know, it, it'll be enough to scare us from stargazing for a while, she mentioned. She also added, I was shaken up for about five days. It really messed me up. However, she didn't feel threatened by the UFO. She says... I didn't feel threatened at all, actually, when she was thinking back on it. It looked to me and we made eye contact. And I think that's what really shook me, looking into the eyes of something that I couldn't quite wrap my head around. This is an interesting story. And while she was under the influence, she did mention that all the other cars on the road all stopped and saw this craft as well. And she believes that she made eye contact with it. Once again, this is becoming a kind of a new cool thing among celebrities to talk about their UFO sightings or their paranormal experiences. Is it a, a, a celebrity stunt or is it legitimate? We don't know. But these people, these celebrities have such an influence on their audience, which consists of millions of, of people that in a way, I'm very happy that they're having this conversation, that they're making it public, regardless on if their encounter was real or not. They're inspiring their audience. They're, they're making their audience open their minds to these possibilities, allowing them to muse about them. And so while many people aren't really fond of celebrities and what they have to say regarding their lives... With something like this, I think it's a really big deal because in my opinion, the UFO conversation is the biggest and most important conversation that humanity is having right now. So I overall, I, I am glad that she spoke about this publicly, even though it happened some time ago. And I think there is some extra drama added into the narrative here. And, and I would be with my eyes more on the skies if I saw a UFO coming after my car, especially if it had looked like a snowplow, because I love snow so much. But I do wonder how many people see such bizarre objects and don't report them. Maybe these celebrity sightings can make more people open up about it. And I'm bringing this up because I had spoken to a Japanese UFO researcher, Norio Hayakawa, and it's on, it's on Shifting the Paradigm. You can find that interview. And he mentioned that 
he believes that people are pre-selected to have UFO experiences. So could celebrities be pre-selected to have these experiences so they can talk about them publicly, influencing their millions of, of fans to have them talk about it to make it more digestible for people? Or is it just a publicity stunt? We we don't we don't know, but it is something that we should think about. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here. Oh, excuse me. Oh my gosh, we're almost done. Hopefully, you're enjoying all these articles so far. Um, moving on to this next one. This one is kind of comical and actually really sad for the person that it happened to. But for everyone listening, it is kind of funny. I'm going to share my screen here of a golfer. Do you play golf? Me, I know absolutely 100% nothing about golf. Like, I don't know the people at play. I don't know the lingo. I just know that you need to hit the ball into the hole. I've played like miniature golf and that's kind of fun but i never played like real golf well the title for this article is golfer bit off man's nose in argument over a golf game there are those that are just very passionate about sports and hey i respect that but are you gonna be so passionate are you gonna bite off someone's nose like clean off no I, I hope not, at least. So an argument between two men over a golf game led one golfer to bite the nose off another in a parking lot of a casino. They, um, <laughs> this police officer by the name of Toby Schwartz said in a news release that Mark Wells, 51 years old, initially fled the scene in a Tesla before turning himself in. The nose was not found as the victim was taken to a hospital. So just imagine. They call 911. They come in. They see this man. His face is bleeding. And they're like, hey, are you okay? Here's a napkin, right? And when this poor victim, like, brings down his hand to grab this napkin, there is no nose there. It's pretty freaky. It's like Halloween all over again. Officers responded to a complaint of an assault at the Hollywood Casino Monday night, arrived to, to find a victim with a disfiguring facial injury. The investigation determined that the suspect... Mark Wells bit the nose off of the victim. Officers were told that Wells and the victim had been arguing throughout the day over a golf game they played at the resort's course. Wells was charged with felony mayhem and booked into the Hancock County Jail, which I do like the way that they said booked into the jail, like booked into a hotel, making it sound luxurious when it's absolutely not where he paid the required 10% of, of a $50,000 bond himself and walked out within the hour. Wells, face up, Wells faces up to seven years in prison if convicted of the felony, which state law defines as a premeditated crime committed with the intent to kill, in which the suspect mutilates, def de defigures, disables or destroys someone's tongue, eye, lip, nose, limb, or any other body part. An official at the jail wouldn't say whether Wells has a lawyer, lawyer or who could comment on his behalf. It's a very short article. Um, it's extreme. It's strange. This is weekly strange news. So, of course, we are covering it. Because, again... Great. If you like sports, if you're passionate about them, I am all for it. It is a great escape from the real world. I get it. But to the point where you're so passionate, you're going to bite off someone's nose because you're in an argument. There is no excuse for something like that. There are no exceptions for something like that. So we'll see what happens in court, if he will go to prison or not. But right now, there is a $50,000 bond on him. So 
this this hit the news kind of hard when it came out and i i was shocked to be honest uh -uh. have have you ever come across a story like this have it be with sports or have it be with just a, a an average argument that's not average at all this is the first time for me Last week, we spoke about some of the weirdest crimes that happened in 2022. One of them dealing with Bigfoot. Um, but this one is, is, is a whole different kettle of fish. It is very odd. Moving on to our next one. Okay, let me let me share my screen for this next article that I have for you. Dun, dun, dun. This one. Let me share an image here. This is kind of a more of an old account. However, it's been making its rounds recently across different media platforms. So something old is coming back to be new, kind of. So a former CIA agent has shared a shocking deathbed confession saying that Area 51 is real and that he went there and saw real-life aliens. The anonymous 77-year-old spoke to UFO researcher Richard Dolan and award-winning documentary maker Jeremy Corbell during a sit-down interview where he lifted the lid on top-secret government projects. So this took place a good amount of years ago, but once again, multiple outlets have retouched on this story. So if you are not familiar with it, you're in for a treat. So he made claims about the infamous Area 51, stating that he's seen UFOs in the flesh and confirmed the existence of extraterrestrials. He gave the sensational interview after allegedly being warned to stop sharing confidential information as he thought he would soon pass away. The anonymous agent was concerned about sharing his true identity, so it simply went by the anonymous during the interview. He claimed that he worked for the CIA between 1957 and 1960, as Howe's and Wise reports, where he spent time in a military base in the southeast of the United States, where he analyzed physical evidence. Then you have Linda Moulton Howe, who interviewed the, him in 1998, and the 11 hours of audio tapes where he went by the name of Agent Cooper, he shares secrets that were supposed to be confidential. Following the interview, he was allegedly warned to not say anything more by the CIA. But in 2013, fearing that he might soon pass, he came out of hiding for one more conversation with Richard Dolan. He claimed that he was taken into Area 51 to look at items allegedly found and retrieved by the U.S. government, and he claimed along them was a flying saucer that crashed and landed in July of 1947 in Roswell, New Mexico. He also claimed that there were live aliens there and that he was taken to the S-4 facility in Area 51, where he claims he saw live extraterrestrials. So this is actually, this is new to me, I'm not going to lie, about this guy and, and the deathbed confession. So I am just reporting what was hitting the news cycle. Again, I just want to make that very clear. This is new to me. And it's making its rounds across social media. Did this really happen? Is this guy telling the truth? We will never know. But we have Richard Dolan, Jeremy Corbell, and Linda Moulton Howe, who have all spoken to him. He said, it took us 13 or 15 miles south to S4 and like different garage door openings. And in these garage door openings, they had like different saucer craft. The very first one had the Roswell craft, and it was kind of crashed up, but apparently every alien that was in it died except for a couple. The Roswell craft was really strange because it looked like really heavy aluminum foil. 
we could walk to we could walk next to it and the whole thing probably weighed about 150 to 300 pounds cooper continued at s4 we viewed the autopsy film and then the colonel said that we've got it here and we're actually interviewing the gray alien we had no idea what we were going to see, the real thing, and all we saw um, was the film. He stated that it didn't look human as far as the skin tone and basically the shape of it and the size, how its head size compared with the normal body. For example, the brain was kind of a little bit bigger than the nose. It was very, very small. And the ears were just holes and the mouth was very small as well. And once again, once this show is over, I will put all of the links to these articles in the description box below for those that do want to read it in detail. Tina, thank you so much for sharing the YouTube link of the deathbed confession. It's um, it's interesting. It, it this is this is this is news to me. So I was kind of shocked when I came across this. But what do you think about this? story that is once again making its rounds, which I was a little surprised um, that a handful of news outlets are touching on this case again. It makes me question why that's the case, because while it might be entertaining for some, there has to be a reason behind that. But how many of you have heard of this case before? And how many was it the first time that you've heard this? It was new to me, but I, I am I am all for learning anything and everything, having an open mind to all of these possibilities, but of course being a skeptic as well. We simply cannot believe everything that we are told, but we can't close our minds to everything either. It's just gonna be you need to have that that healthy middle path where you're open minded but you're still skeptical, you still have questions, but you're not stating, nah, obviously not true, a thousand percent not true, right? That's not healthy. Gotta have that middle path. Jamie says, new to me. Zach says, new to me as well. Jamie says, I'm with you, Christina. Balance. And not just with research, but that's what life is all about, having that balance, taking that middle path. It's, it's going to make you enjoy life just a little bit more and help you rationalize everything that's going on in life when you take that middle path. Abby says, never heard about this. Jack says, yeah, I remember it. Seemed legit. Jack, thank you for saying that. I want to know how many others are familiar with this case. Maka says, seems like certain things, mindsets, paradigms are starting to crumble and shift that have been shadowed in disinformation. This is true. M says, I heard this 10 years ago from Richard Dolan. Yeah, th this, is a, this is an old um, story that's just resurfacing now. Mark says, allegedly, Linda Moulton Howe introduced the story to Dolan at a conference, and he did the interview without prior knowledge. Linda Moulton Howe didn't want to do the interview herself. Interesting. I didn't know that. And now I want to ask, why didn't she want to do the interview herself? What was the reason for it? Because I have so many questions. Creative learning. In New York says, we are the living mystery. Our limits are imagination. Hi, Christina. Hi, chat. Hi there. William says, a first timer on this story. Me too. Well, I have just one more super short article for you before we end today's show. And that is the world's oldest tortoise has been seen off two world wars and the British Empire. The oldest tortoise is believed to be about 190 years old. As we know, tortoises have incredibly long lives because of their breathing patterns, the way about 
the the rate at which their heart beats because it is um, slower, they're able to live longer, which is super duper cool. I'm going to share an image here of this lovely tortoise before we uh, close out here. Hold on. Give me just a moment. Let me pull this up. Take a look at this guy. He's seen it all. This tortoise has seen two world wars and British Empire. It's insane. And you can just see it in its eyes. He's so cute. I, I like, I personally uh, like turtles. Now, if you are going to, fun fact, if you are going to feed turtles, do not feed them bread. Because... Uh, when they eat it, it actually makes them sink and then they die when they're in the water. So if you're ever going to go see a tortoise or a turtle, make sure to feed it lettuce, um, kind of leafy greens, some carrots, things like this. But try, no, don't even try. Do not feed them bread. So many people do. They also feed birds bread as well. It's it, because their bodies aren't used to it. It is not good for them. And for turtles in particular, they will die. And we don't want that. Here's another picture of this cute little 190-year-old turtle. It even looks old. It has like little wrinkles and stuff. Freaking cute. Turtles are adorable. And tortoises. And it kind of has like a, a Yoda look going on. Like Yoda vibes. <laughs> if you're listening to this on a podcast platform, jump over to YouTube. So that you can see these images as well, because we're looking at an adorable 190-year-old tortoise. Well, that is all of the articles that I have for you today. Out of all the ones that we covered, which one was your favorite? For myself, I, I just can't get enough of Krumpus. I, I want to know more. But also, Saturn's moon Titan, that's a really fascinating and big discovery that they were already kind of hypothesizing, theorizing. They had computer models that were proving this, but then they finally got the answers with the James Webb Space Telescope. So super big news. But what about for you? Which article was your favorite? Naka says space. Can never go wrong with space. Love space. It's our future. We are not, we are no longer a human faring species. We are supposed to travel into space. I would like to mention, as I'm reading this article really quick, uh, Jonathan, the tortoise that we just mentioned, has lived on St. Helena, an island situated in the midst of the South Atlantic Ocean, since 1882. When you put it in that perspective, right? It makes you think, oh my gosh, this is a super old tortoise. Like 190 years old, you're like, okay, yeah, that's old. But when you put it in perspective of 1882, the year, you're like, wow, dang. Now, do you know what zoo it's been kept at? And no, because it's just been living on this island, which is, a, which is nice, not a zoo which is fantastic. No zoo, li li living his best life. Jonathan's living his best life on an island, free grazing, living the dream. Well, Dark Star says Titan and the B-21 were his favorite articles. And Daniel says, Titan, let's go Titan. Let's go Teen Titans. The original uh, cartoon was really good. I liked that one. Tina says, XCIA Area 51 story is my favorite. And of course, the turtle. Yes. Can never go wrong with turtles. Well, I want to wish you all a wonderful weekend. Please like this video before you head out. Um, I want to thank all of my incredible moderators all the super chats, super stickers, everyone watching this live, all of the YouTube members and Patreon subscribers. I simply could not do this without you. Be safe and remember, keep your eyes on the skies. Mm -hmm.